now. Hey there gang, it's time for headstock. This one isn't the most devastating sort of break, but it doesn't really matter how bad they are or how they happen. It's always a traumatic experience. This got broken on stage when the person who was playing it fell into a hole that had been left between two risers that had been covered with tape. The hole was big enough to fit your leg in. It's lucky he didn't break his. Uh, the SG wasn't so lucky. People contact me from time to time asking, how do I know whether a broken headstock needs splines in it, or a backstrap overlay, or that more convoluted jigsaw assemblage thing that I do? It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, if the headstock remains attached to the neck, but opens like a hinge, like this, with a nice diagonal break that doesn't extend through the front veneer, this is a straight glue up. It doesn't need any splines, doesn't need anything else. The glue alone is going to be just fine. If it happens again, and especially in cases where the crack opens up exactly on the previous glue line due to inexpert work or insufficient clamping pressure or poor choice of adhesive, I treat that joint as contaminated. The two pieces might key together perfectly, but if they're coated with polyurethane or vinyl glue, then the pores in the wood and its surface, they've been sealed, and it's unlikely that anything other than an epoxy really has a chance of holding them together. So what the spline does is provide fresh gluing surfaces that cross the line of the brake. It's insurance. Now, if you're going to use splines, they have to fit right. This is where I want to put a caution on all those videos where I demonstrate their use because I've seen people tag me in images online citing me as an inspiration and they've gone ahead and they've cut the channels by hand with a chisel and a knife and I have to say, you'd need to be superhuman in your abilities to cut them accurately enough by hand. If there's any little gap or undercutting, if you're relying on glue to take up the room between the parts, it's not going to be strong enough. You've made it weaker, in fact, and it would have been better if you not put any splines in at all. And those elaborate assemblies where I route everything away from the truss rod, those are situations where the neck has broken off with no overlap between the parts. It's a straight vertical break with nothing to hold it together, and there's no other way to get the pieces to stay. Now there are other techniques that involve surrounding the area of the break with resin impregnated fiberglass or even carbon fiber. Those can be pretty messy. Um, they're not easy to do cleanly. And I've seen them break, too. I've seen every kind of headstock repair re-break. It's not something you should tell them to their face, but there are people out there who shouldn't own Gibsons or other guitars with angled headstocks. These people have butterfingers, they're accident-prone, careless, uh, they just don't have the discipline not to lean their guitar against a sliding glass door, you know. And they break them over and over again. The first time it's like, oh man, that's sad. The third time it's like, mm, yeah, okay, sure, mm -hmm, right? On the other hand, I have a client who has played the same exceptionally heavy 1970s Les Paul. I think weighs like 14 pounds. He's had it for 45 years. And... It's played at least 3,000 gigs around the world. Never broken. He treats it like a classical musician treats a Stradivarius. It's never going to break because he simply won't let that happen. However, if you do happen to step into a void between stages, and it does break, it's important to loosen the strings immediately and just put it in the case. And the case will protect it from further damage and uh, keep it from getting dirty, which is another thing we want to prevent happening. Uh, a clean glue joint is much better in the long run. I need to remove the tuners and the truss rod cover to give me access for clamping. I made this ridiculous little thing because sometimes when you um, take the tuners off and put them back on again in the wrong order, you sort of develop a feel for how a particular tuner works in a certain location. And it's nice if they go back in the same spots. If the fracture breaks into the truss rod cavity, it's a good idea to wax off the rod. 
choice of adhesive doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If you had some hide glue cooking, you could use that. Fish glue. Uh, yellow woodworking glue like this. Polyurethane. Epoxy. As long as you get it clamped up good and tight, they'll all work. And uh, I tend to get a bit more in there than I need and just wipe off the excess because I want to make sure it gets all the way down to the ends. This is a sheet of quarter inch um, ultra high molecular weight plastic. Glue doesn't like sticking to it. I should try and clean out that truss rod pocket as well as I can before going too much farther. On this side I have this oddly shaped cork backed call which comes down to the point on the back of a Gibson headstock and uh, lets me clamp in there and also get decent access for removing most of the squeeze out. Just cleaning off the residue. Um, so that glued up pretty nice and level. Get you in close here. We're missing a fragment of lacquer, which is not uncommon. They tend to blow off and end up on the floor somewhere. Um, and it's kind of annoying in its disappearance, as you can feel it. So I'm going to fill that, and actually the entire fracture line, with some thin super glue and level it off a little bit. Yeah, I should mention that perfection in the surface is probably not all that necessary in this case. Touring musician's gear, you know. I think elks and moose occasionally come out in the winter to lick at this thing. So I'm just going to color in this area with some black pen. I may go back and give this thing a spray of rattle can lacquer when I'm done, just to sort of unify things a little bit. But for right now, I'm going to use multiple coats of this uh, thin super glue, applied sparingly. This is going to fill up that crack line. The woodworking glue almost always shrinks back from the crack a little bit as it dries. It uh, leaves a little line there which is feelable and viewable. Now, there are a number of different products you can use for this. Different manufacturers of super glue. You guys know I use the fairly inexpensive stuff. It's not that I don't like the more expensive brands, it's just I find that, um, I don't know, I'm used to the viscosity of this. It works the way I expect it to. Some of them actually cure too fast. So really what I'm aiming to do here is build up um, coats that are above the surface. I want a little hump there rather than a dip. Here we have a Norman guitar. I have a fondness for Normans. Quick history on these. In terms of Canadian guitar manufacturing, there are really two big names. We've got Jean Larive on the west coast, and in Quebec there's Robert Godin. There are going to be some French-Canadian pronunciations in this segment. I hope I do them justice. Um, you might hear it pronounced as Godin. In Quebecois, it's more like Godin. French-Canadian has some differences um, from what's spoken in Paris, especially in the vowel sounds and, like, terminating consonants. I-N's become more like an, and, well, plural S's are dropped entirely, but that's another thing. Another example, the French fry and gravy and cheese thing that Americans are picking up on these days, it's not poutine, it's more like poutine. Anyway, Robert, or Robert, has been building guitars and guitar companies in southern Quebec for about 50 years now, centered around a little village called La Patrie in the southeast corner of the province, 
um, in that strange strip of land that is somehow south of the St. Lawrence River and bordering Maine and upstate New York. And when I say little, it, it's really little. I think there are less than a thousand people who live there. Norman was the very first line of guitars that Godin started making in the early 1970s. He also founded a bunch of other lines that are similar but distinct. Um, my very first guitar, the one I got when I was 10 years old, was an LYS, a Lee, which was a short-lived label of his from the early 80s. He also formed Seagull, Simon and Patrick, Art and Luthery, and under his own name, Godin. I believe his sons are now running the show, mostly, but he's still around. But these are the classic Canadian entry-level instrument. They make all levels of quality in their various lines, but at the core is this very straightforward, no-nonsense kind of building, good quality products at a low price. I mean, to this day, if you want a decent entry-level guitar made in North America, it's your choice, you know. They are the best value for money. I tell people this all the time. And to be honest, players who start off on these tend to keep them forever. You know, they're hard to part with. They're, they're very endearing guitars. This one, I think, is a pretty early example. This is a B50 12 string. This one is following pretty close on the heels of Epiphone's 12 strings uh, made in Japan. because so we've got this Fender-style bolt-on neck. Other than that, it's very representative of a Robert Godin entry-level construction from the 70s and 80s, using this uh, aircraft birch plywood uh, for the sides and back. This one's a little more dressy. It's got a fancy sort of back strip on it. Often on lower-end production, they would just take two strips of their plywood, glue it together, turn it on edge, and you end up with this decorative glue line, which is a very economical solution. And there are a number of things going on here. Uh, most pressing is that it needs a neck reset, which isn't too terribly difficult or expensive on these because it's got the bolt-on neck. You can see there's some shade tree luthing going on here with some extra hardware to provide some downward pressure over the saddle, which is too low. In several places the binding is cracked and pulling away. There is a bit of bellying going on behind the bridge, which is not uncommon for a 50-year-old 12-string. I'm not sure if that requires intervention or not. I'm going to have a look on the inside to see what the braces are like and make sure nothing's come loose, but I suspect we'll probably work with it as it is. Super glue is dry on the SG, so I'll start to scrape it level with a razor blade, which has been wrapped in a couple of strips of scotch tape. Uh, this provides a kind of depth stop and also prevents the corners from digging in. Following that, I'll sand with some 600 grit paper to further level it and prep it for some paint. This is black lacquer in a can. It's a light mist. Let that dry for a little while. These days I'm using some Mohawk, well it's Balin stringed instrument lacquer. It's pretty good stuff. Yes, I'm wearing a respirator. Let's get all the usual measurements. These provide a, it's a useful benchmark for progress. And after you've done it enough times, you start to form a picture of what's normal and sometimes what you can get away with. See, the action, it doesn't feel too bad to me right now. I think a lot of people would be quite happy with this string height. The main reason for resetting the neck is going to be to increase the saddle height so there's more downward pressure on it. Um, a lot of these measurements I take really only start to make sense in concert with all the other measurements. You know, it's a whole picture. If I find there's a huge amount of relief in the neck, uh, that could be the reason it needs a low saddle, you know. And sometimes if the saddle has good height and the string action at the 12th fret is also great, but somehow the guitar still feels really stiff and difficult to play, maybe the nut height is too high. You know, it all works together. In this case, we've got uh, String height of about 6 64ths, 5 and a half 64ths, and virtually no relief. This is a very straight neck. When you're working on 12 strings, it's really handy if you can keep the strings on throughout the process, if you're doing stuff that involves action height. You don't want to have to string and unstring these things, because somehow restringing a 12 takes more time than stringing two 6 strings. 
the annoyance curve that comes from adding strings is exponential rather than linear. In the past I've shown how I like to clamp the strings between two cork padded blocks of wood to keep them in place and so they don't get twisted. I've heard from others recently that Velcro is the way to go, so I'm giving this a try out. I'm not convinced yet. So far it's kind of working. Oh boy. I figured the easiest way to deal with the tear out and the screw holes was to route and plug the whole area. So I got out the routing jig, plowed out a little channel, I went searching and found some wood that was pretty similar. Not exactly sure what species this bridge was made from. It looks a little bit like Bubinga, kind of. So I planed things to the correct dimensions, checked and fit, then discovered the length, transfer that, cut it, and then filed the ends into a radius. And that fits well, ready for glue. I sawed it flush, sanded it, put a little oil on, and it disappeared pretty well. The bridge plate has damage around the pinholes, and also those screws did a number on it as well and blew out a chunk, so I figured it was best to put in a reinforcement pad. I took some time and glued down the loose binding. I use regular tight bond wood glue for this, it works just fine. It's kind of amazing that they used a two bolt system. It seems to be a Robertson number two. It's a Robbie Red. Ooh! Free pick. And these have four quarter inch dowels, which act as a sort of positioning agent. Um, they can actually complicate things a little bit when doing the full pocket shim that I want to do, but we'll make it work. This is some thicker than usual veneer. It's uh, just over 30 thousandths. It's about 0.8 millimeters. And uh, that will give me enough to really get a good tall saddle on this thing. I think it's elm. That's good and tall. It'll come down some during setup. I'll touch up those nut slots that need some refinement. I'm determining string spacing between the courses and from string to string. I want to impress upon you just how much these necks can move under tension. This thing has a serious amount of back bow. Like the strings are sitting flat on the top of the frets before I start to string it up and bring it to pitch. Even with light gauge strings, they're under a tremendous amount of stress. I've been letting this sit for a few hours to see what it does. I had to play with the shim a little bit, adding some height on the treble side to kick it up over there. There's an issue at play with a lot of old 12 strings, and that is it's um, kind of a combination of deforming that happens to the bridge and the bridge plate that's underneath it. These are quite a bit wider, remember, than your standard flat top bridge. There's a lot more surface area there. And the back end can warp up, basically raising the point at which the strings, especially this back row of strings, leaves it. Uh, in some cases, it, the warp can be so great that the takeoff point is higher than the actual saddle. So now we have a nice tall saddle with good brake angle, and it works fine for this bridge. If this was to warp up any more, I'd be tempted to plane the back half of the bridge down at an angle lowering the takeoff point for those octave strings. Would a bridge doctor help for this? Um, in a lot of 12 string cases, yes. In this one, not so much, I don't think. Um, the belly is there, but it's not excessive. And it's not dipping down in front of the bridge very much. So what we have here is more of a local deforming. It's, a it's like it's in a line, sort of halfway through the bridge like this. Um, to really fix it we'd probably need to tear off the bridge plate underneath and replace it and also make a new bridge. That's a lot of money to sink into this guitar. Planing the bridge probably makes more sense. 
Um, that would be the next logical step. But for right now, we've got lower action. It's now sitting at 5 64ths on the base side, 4 on the treble, which is nice and low. Uh, and it's also got a good break angle that's functioning. So it's doing what we want it to do at the start of the day. And in this configuration, it should be good for some years. Now I'm going to go back in and file the fundamental uh, low E, A, D, and the B strings backwards a bit to get some better intonation for it. Then we'll put on some fresh strings, polish the frets, and see what it sounds like. This is a 332nds 2.4 millimeter saddle, so there's only so much you can achieve with the filing, but it does help. There are two decorative plugs for the neck bolts, one of which was chewed by the family pet. It was a bit loose, so I put on some double stick tape and reinstalled. After about five days, the SG was dry enough to sand. The lacquer will almost certainly continue to shrink back, and there will be visual evidence of the break there, but the goal is to make it look taken care of. I'll rub it out with some polishing compound. Putting on some big boy strings. Don't see that very often. The green package, 11 to 56. These guys play in uh, D with a drop C. Intonation is a bit spotty. The strings are sharp, which means the saddles have to move away from the nut. Now let's chug along in low tuning for a few seconds. <laughs> 